The Second World War was a dark period for the Philippines. As the main battleground of the war in the Asia Pacific, Manila was utterly destroyed by the fight against the Japanese. If the violence didn't kill you, the scarcity of basic necessities and social services probably would. In this backdrop of hardship and struggle, many Filipinos rose to the occasion as guerrilla fighters and resistance leaders, while some decided they'd rather collaborate than cooperate with the Japanese. In this episode of Contested Philippine Histories, let us look at three portraits of Filipinos during the war and ask, were they heroes or were they traitors? Hi, I am Lee Candelaria. I am Bekal Porha. I am Aaron Maliari. And this is Podcast, Conversations on Philippine History, Politics, and Society. Ito na naman tayo sa isa na namang kwentuhan sa kasaysayan. From Quezon and the American occupation of the Philippines and the legacies of colonialism, we proceed to a darker period of our history. Ito ngang ikalawang digmaang pandaigdig. Mm-hmm. And I think it bears mentioning na sa last season natin, mayroon na tayong isang episode focusing on the speech by Jose P. Laurel during the inauguration of the Second Philippine Republic. So, para sa ating mga listeners, kung interested kayo, balikan nyo na lang yung episode na yun. It's season 2, episode 10. To be exact. Pero sa season na to, kung saan ang focus natin ay historical controversies, napapaisip tuloy ako, ano bang mga kontrobersya ang maiuugat talaga natin sa World War II? Ano ba? Dito ba, di ba dito nanggaling yung ano, yung Yamashita's treasure? Yes, yung Yamashita's treasure na yan. Na di umano ay war loot o nakaw na yaman sa panahon ng digmaan sa Southeast Asia ng Japanese Imperial Forces na itinago daw sa mga kweba at underground complexes ng Pilipinas. Interesante ang usapan yan, pero hindi yan ang topic ng episode natin. Kasi una sa lahat, walang kahit anong ebidensya na nag-exist itong treasure na ito. Sa tagal ng panahon na hinanap, hindi nakita ni isang kusing ng gintong ito. We can spend time talking about theories how this gold allegedly formed the basis of the Marcos wealth. For example, kasi mismong si Imelda noong 1992 may statement na, Yamashita's treasure daw ang basis ng Marcos wealth. So medyo may Celtic talaga siya, no? At hindi daw perang utang at nakaw yung pera nila. Pero wala pa rin naman talagang ebidensya. Laway lang. So, you know, I'd rather spend time talking about things that have basis on fact. Na contentious pa rin sa kasalukuyan. And for this episode, mas mag-focus tayo sa usapin ng collaboration and resistance during the war. At again, napapiyawan na natin ito sa episode natin ng season 2. Pero sa konteksto ng digmaan, particular noong ikalawang digmaang pandaigdig, at sa konteksto rin ng Pilipinas na noon ay technically nasa bandila pa rin ng Estados Unidos, mahirap na usapin itong collaboration. Yung resistance, medyo malinaw na response yan at marami sa mga Pilipino ang talagang lumaban sa mga hapon. Pero itong collaboration, if we go by definitions, It's simply cooperation with an enemy country during a particular context kaya ng wartime. At mahirap na usapin niyang collaboration. Ito such a delicate topic after the war. Kasi ang, ang hirap mag-akusa na collaborator ang isang tao dahil lang napilitan silang makipag-cooperate uh, or makipagkaisa with the Japanese. Because it was, after all, a question of survival. So kung cooperate or die ang options na meron ka, would you really take it against a person kung nakipag-cooperate man siya that period? Kaya nga, instead of drawing a hard line between collaborators and resistors, or sa title nga nating Heroes or Traitors, let's look at some individual cases para rin maipakita natin yung diversity of responses to the Japanese noong panahon ng Hapon. And I'd like to start with the case of Josepi Laurel. Yes, sabi nga ni Aaron, nabanggit na natin kanina, we discussed him episode 10 ng ating Primary Sources and New Season, at nabanggit natin na consistent with the analysis of war historians and experts, Laurel remained, together with other Commonwealth officials, upon the instruction of President Quezon himself. His election, or more properly, uh, selection as president by the Japanese, is because he was seen as anti-United States, and has Japan-leaning tendencies. We also mentioned how, during his presidency, uh, that he did his best to protect Filipinos in whatever way he could, uh, even personally complaining to the Japanese officials all the instances of Japanese abuses like warrantless arrest, wanton display of violence, etc., etc. Uh, he also refused uh, the conscription of Filipinos to become soldiers under 
uh, the Japanese military and refused to declare war against the United States in the name of the Philippines. So, he may have cooperated with Japan, but it's not blind collaboration. Uh, it's for the country's, you know, survival. At may magandang explanation si Jorge B. Vargas, a key official of the Second Republic, to clarify the positions they had to take together with Laurel during the war. And yeah, this applies to Laurel then. Sabi niya, they never collaborated with the Japanese in the sense of working for them or for their benefit. Instead, they negotiated in behalf of the interest of civilian populations or non-combatant Filipinos to temper Japanese mil- militarism. Ania, quote, No official in the Philippines, whether high or low, ever felt he was doing anything for the benefit of the Japanese but only serving the welfare of his country and people, end of quote. Nice. Although we must take it with a grain of salt din kasi anybody can also say that kahit ang katotohan na naman ay nakipag-collaborate talaga sila to the detriment of the Filipinos. Halimbawa, uh, yung makapili o yung makabayang katipunan ng mga Pilipino, a group that was trained by the Japanese to destroy the nation's enemies, quote-unquote. So, yung training nila ay espionage, sabotage, at iba pang mga related na gawain. Pero sa case ni Laurel, I think, What happened after the war can show how his actions during the war was perceived. He was never brought to trial and was even amnestied in 1948. No? So he even ran for president in 1949, although syempre natalo siya ni Elpidio Quirino uh, in an election that according to some ay dinaya daw. No? So he remained popular and his career in government continued, even topping the senatorial race in 1951. Which he considered as the vindication of his reputation. That was enough for him, no? And and he retired in 1957. Uh, na imagine ko na siguro happy naman siya, kasi in a way na vindicate yung yung image niya. And because he felt that he did enough, uh, only to be referred to as the puppet president in Filipino textbooks. Mi yun yung medyo siguro complicated. Yes, I mean he might he must be staring in his grave now. But you know, I think this only goes out to show how we should really periodically revisit our notions of the past kasi hindi rin kasi talaga nare-represent yung complexity ng nakaraan sa pag-aaral natin ng kasaysayan eh. And speaking of stuff we don't study in history, let's look at another portrait of a Filipino during the war. A school teacher turned into a guerrilla fighter, Nieves Fernandez. Interesting itong si Nieves Fernandez kasi mayroon siyang iconic photo where she was demonstrating how she used a knife to kill Japanese soldiers. Ah, yung pala yung name niya. May, hindi ako familiar sa name niya pero yung picture na yun is, is very striking. No? So, and I think tama ba yung ano ko na parang isa siya dun sa very few guerrilla leader na babae diba, that, that we know of. Indeed, pero itong si Captain Fernandez, as we'd like to call her, started as an assassin. She would operate alone, hiding in the bushes with a makeshift shotgun, and ambush the Japanese. Dose-dose na daw ang naa-ambush niya. Nak, so parang si Leslie ng ML, ano? pero assassin build. <laughs> Oo, medyo parang ganun. <laughs> Eventually, uh, she inspired the men of Tacloban, so she took them in and trained them to become guerrilla fighters. They made their own weapons, yung tinatawag na paltik sa Tagalog, or yung latong sa Bisaya. And according to U.S. intelligence officers, the Japanese offered 10,000 pesos for the head of Captain Fernandez. Wow, 10,000 pesos was definitely big money during that time. No? So, uh, she was really feared by the Japanese in that sense. No? So, and isn't it refreshing to hear the story of the heroism of women during this period? Because... Laging halos male heroes na lang yung nare-represente. Totoo yan, as if naman kasarian yung basis ng heroism, ano? Alam natin hindi yan totoo uh, in so many levels. Isang halimbawa niya na itong guerrilla fighter leader daw, pero napatunayan namang peke pala. And of course, I'm talking about Ferdinand Marcos. Alam niya, isa to sa... Actually, ano, pinaka nakakatawa, pero at the same time, nakaka-bother na stories about Marcos. Kung baga, hindi ko alam, napaka on brand nito. Yeah, you know, just Marcos doing Marcos things. <laughs> diba? Kasi according to him, uh, as in siya lang ang source, ha? Uh, namuno daw siya ng guerrilla group na binansagang uh, quote-unquote maharlika. 
ba? No? So, kung babalikan yung retrievable information about Marcos during the war, yes, totoo naman na he was called into the army as a reservist and he was taken prisoner by the Japanese in 1942. But from his release in August 1942 hanggang sa matapos ang digmaan, Uh, yung his claims are just, you know, in, in a way, incredulous. At kapatunayan na, na isa o dalawa lang ang totoo sa mga awards na yan, pero kahit yung dalawang yon or yung isang yon questionable pa din. At ang isa pa sa pinakabaliw, no, na war story nitong si Marcos, ay yung uh, together with only 100 men, sabi niya, he heroically defended the junction of two rivers in Bataan for five days. So they were allegedly uh, fighting 2,000 highly trained and well-equipped Japanese troops. At dahil sa kanilang galing, because of their might and skill, his leadership actually worked to delay the fall of Bataan. So, sobrang unrealistic. Uh, anong kalokohan to? <laughs> Di ba? Ay, superpowers. And how incredulous. Well, ang sabi niya, it was during this time that he led the Maharlika guerrilla unit. The unit allegedly had the force of 9,000 men. And it was his exploits with this guerrilla group that he earned war medals. In fact, ang claim niya, he was the most decorated war hero of the Philippines during World War II, having received 33 awards. Yeah, probably ano yan, di ba? Probably inspired by by historical battles like the Persian Wars at the Battle of Thermopylae. You know, siguro, of course, matalino naman talaga si Ferdinand Marcos, we cannot deny that. And he is well-read, so probably nabasa niya talaga yung uh, mga akda na yan. Pero di ba, parang at least yung yung mga Spartans 300 naman sila, di ba? Itong si Marcos talaga ba 100, di ba? Tapos 2,000 yung kalaban. Parang ano yun, di ba? Parang hindi talaga. Naalala ko tuloy yung uh, episode natin on The Battle of Mactan, no? Parang ganito rin yun, eh, yung kwento na... Uh, pero at least sa kwentong yun, sabi ni Pegafeta, natalo sila. Dito, ang kwento ni Marcos, nanalo sila. And there were other incredulous claims by Marcos and his war participation, no? Ang malinaw dito, he and his guerrilla unit were never recognized by the United States. Bakit kailangan ba i-recognize ng US itong mga guerrilla groups? Yes. Kasi these groups were assisting the Americans in the reconquest of the Philippines. And the U.S. had a program to recognize their guerrilla participation as service to the United States. Yeah, at hindi lang yun, no? Once recognized, uh, guerrillas fighting for the U.S. can ask for back pay for the, for the services rendered. And the longer the service, the, the bigger the remuneration, no? So, syempre, may usapin ng kapirahan. Naisip siguro ni Marcos, no? Kaching, kaching! Kasi he applied to have the Maharlika guerrilla unit recognized. Pero anong sabi ng mga Amerikano? Sabi nila, it is fraudulent. Various documents, eyewitness accounts, the U.S. Army, and even later on, in recent years, actually, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines disproved his claims. That's right. Yung report na yan ng NHCP ay available online, by the way. Kung mm-hmm. gusto nyong basahin kung uh, paano nirabat ng historians itong claims ni Marcos. Pero ang nakakatawa pa dito, mukha talagang 99% ng kwento ni Marcos uh, about the war ay peke. Isa sa interesting na claim niya, ito ha, yung kwento niya, nakatakas daw siya mula sa kanyang pagkakulong sa Fort Santiago. Tapos, he went on to found a guerrilla unit. So, according sa record naman ng mga Hapon, uh, pinalaya siya actually. At yung mga napapalayang sundalo, uh, usually sila yung may mga sakit. At yung may mga pamilyang collaborators of the Japanese. And true enough, actually, his father, Don Mariano Marcos, worked as a propagandist um, for the Japanese during the war. So, take note, ano? A collaborator na in-execute mismo ng mga guerrilla, particularly ng Luzon Guerrilla Armed Forces. Oo, grabe yung grabe, no? kwento kung paano siya in-execute ng mga guerrilla. Um, ang kwento ay may apat na kabayo at itinali yung kanyang limbs sa apat na kabayo at saka pinatakbo yung mga kabayo. This is this, this actually on record. Oh my God. Quartering? Yes. Oh my God. That's... Yes, quartering. Sobrang yes, at medieval. yung kanyang torso daw ay isinabit sa kung nasaan ngayon yung Don Mariano Marcos University, if I'm not mistaken. Pero yun nga eh, imagine all the Don Mariano Marcos schools, avenues, streets. Uh, alam ko yung Commonwealth Avenue, Don Mariano Marcos Avenue yan eh, um, for some time. Um, these things are actually named after a known collaborator. 
Pero siyempre, si Ferdy, he was quick to spin the story. Ang kwento niya, anti-Japanese daw ang tatay niya at Japanese daw ang nag-execute. But then again, no evidence were presented. Grabe no, hindi, ko, hindi ako makapaniwala minsan na nagagawa niya talaga yung maghugot ng story out of nothing. Means almost nothing, di ba? Kasi, in a way, parang minsan naisip ko ang lungkot din siguro nung ganun no, na for him to have an imaginary guerrilla unit of 9,000 people. Ewan ko, parang ano yun eh, 9,000 imaginary friends. Ewan ko. Ang tawag dyan, illusion of grandeur. Pero malinaw din ano, kung ano talaga yung intent niya as early as the 1940s. Malinaw na meron siyang intention na manggatso, magsinungaling, all for money and glory and fame and power. So just compare Marcos to the likes of Jose P. Laurel or Captain Nieves Fernandez. I think we really know agad-agad who the heroes are and who the traitor is. Hmm. Masaya itong parang party game na to na parang I will name three historical personalities Guess who's the hero and guess who's the traitor. And use historical evidence to support your claim. Diba? Fun. Mm. Kami natin minsan yan. Oh, that's so, so much fun. <laughs> But I'm afraid that's all the time we have for this episode. Sana ay nag-enjoy ang ating mga listeners. Medyo pahapyaw na natin napag-usapan si Marcus this episode. Pero yung mga susunod nating episodes, mas magiging in-depth ang ating discussions about this guy. Kasi si Marcus ay isang historical controversy na nagkatawang tao. Yes, and in the next episode, We'll talk about the Jabi the Massacre and whether it happened or not happened. For now, like, follow, or subscribe to our social media pages. We are everywhere and listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. And of course, you can also watch the, the recordings on YouTube through Podcast TV. And of course, you can also visit our website to access all of our episodes. And dun sila lahat na kalink. So that's www.pod cast.org. So for more of the good stuff on Philippine history, politics, and society, just keep on listening and have a good day.